Hello, I'm Andrew Goddard, President of the Royal College of Physicians, and it's a pleasure to be able to welcome you to this, the SAS webinar. This is all part of our SAS week, uh, which fits onto our SAS strategy. Uh, the importance of SAS doctors in our NHS uh, has never been greater than it is now. And one of the things I'm about to have got another seven weeks left in my presidency. One of the things that I perhaps am proudest of in my time is how we have brought SAS doctors to the fore within the college, both from the point of view of recognising them uh, as fellows and opening them up to fellowship, uh, but also through that, allowing them to become PACES examiners and to take up college officer and senior officer positions. The first tranche of uh, SAS doctors uh, as PACES examiners are just coming towards the end of their training. Uh, and I'm really excited that that is something that is going to happen. Uh, and I would hope, therefore, we get more and more people coming through that uh, as people know it is, it is an option. This webinar will hopefully give you a bit of a taster about what the college is doing uh, with regards to SAS doctors. Uh, I would hope, uh, and actually I know that under Sarah Clark, uh, the next president who starts in the middle of September, uh, that SAS doctors will continue to be a massive part of what the college does. Uh, if you're an SAS doctor, I'd just like to thank you uh, for everything that you do for the NHS and thank you for your contributions to the college. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, within uh, the SAS team uh, in the college for everything they've done to pull people together uh, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Well hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us for this really exciting pre-recorded webinar that is really celebrating the role of SAS doctors across the workforce in the United Kingdom and really trying to understand what we can do to ensure that we're promoting the roles that SAS doctors are undertaking, but also considering what the Royal College of Physicians can do to further that support that's available. You've already heard our introduction from Bod, and it's absolutely fantastic that as a president, he has been so prolific in supporting the SAS doctor role and indeed a huge advocate of ensuring that we have representation at council and real support across the Royal College for the SAS strategy. And we're now going to hear from three colleagues who have been exceptionally involved, not just with the college, but also the SAS committee and looking at really making sure that we are developing and celebrating the roles that SAS doctors and physicians undertake. And then at the end, we're running a brief in conversation between me and Catherine Edwards, the college registrar. So what I'll do is just give you a very brief introduction to our fantastic speakers today. And we're going to hear firstly from Sarah Mungle. And Sarah qualified from Nottingham University in 1997 and undertook her medical rotations in the Midlands before moving to Bristol in 2001, where she obtained her MRCP. She initially pursued a career in respiratory medicine before becoming a staff grade in respiratory and acute medicine in 2004. And she now works as an associate specialist in respiratory medicine at the Bristol Royal Infirmary. Sarah is also the Deputy Academy Dean for South Bristol Academy and has an honorary contract with Bristol University. We'll then hear from our colleague Walid Arshad, who was the SAS lead for the Royal College before I took over earlier this year. And Walid is an Associate Specialist Cardiologist and the SAS Tutor at Homerton University Hospital, as well as an honorary Clinical Senior Lecturer at Queen Mary University of London. He's also the immediate past chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges SAS committee and the immediate past RCP SAS lead. In addition to those national roles, he's also part of the hospital's medical education committee and works hard as part of the appraisal and revalidation group. Waleed has a very heavy commitment to formal teaching, both an undergraduate and a postgraduate level, and has been very much involved in the AIMRC publication of the numerous SAS uh, promoting documents. And last of all, we're going to hear from Helen, and Helen is an Associate Specialist working in Specialist Palliative Care Medicine in Liverpool. 
She works between the Marie Curie Hospice in Liverpool and the Liverpool Heart and Chess Hospital and has been the Merseyside representative on the SAS representative committee since May 2020. Helen's very passionate about SAS doctors being recognised for their contribution and delivery of healthcare, and she's been an educational supervisor for the last six years, something that she's very much going to tell us about as part of her uh, presentation today. So I really look forward to hearing their presentations. We, as always, really value your feedback, and I hope that what we've produced and we're going to share with you will be useful. Please do let us know if you'd like to be involved and look forward to seeing you throughout this week for our various SAS events. Thank you very much. So uh, my name is um, Sarah Mungal. Um, I'm an associate specialist in respiratory medicine in Bristol. Uh, thank you very much for asking me to come and um, talk about um, my experience, really, um, as an SAS doctor, particularly um, as an appraiser um, and a, a developer. Um, so. I'm going to talk a little bit about what my experiences are and accept that experiences are different for everybody. But what I would say is I made the sort of positive choice to become an SAS doctor back in um, 2004. And I made that decision because I was really keen to stay in Bristol and to um, have and bring up a family in Bristol. And I felt that that wasn't really going to work for me in the traditional um, career pathway. And I'd had quite a traditional career up until that point. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't perhaps take a lot of careers advice. I did have some feedback that perhaps um, being an SAS doctor was for those people who were um, less ambitious. And I am somebody who was quite ambitious. Um, and so that was quite difficult, but I felt, yeah, actually, this is the right decision for me. Um, and I'm really pleased to say in 2022 that I do feel that I made the right decision. And it's really nice to see the recognition, both from the Royal College of Physicians, but also a lot of other bodies that actually SAS physicians have a lot to contribute. Um, and I feel that I have been able to develop my career um, in a positive way and that I've actually been able to do that on my own terms. And for me, that's been really important. Uh, I wouldn't say it's always been easy. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what my career pathway has been, and hopefully there'll be some sort of hints and tips along the way of, of things that I'd learned and perhaps would have been good for me to, to know. I, I, and I would say that the key thing is that I think you have to be really, really proactive and it's really important to seize any opportunities that you can when they come along. So as I said, I was training um, in respiratory medicine and I decided to become a staff grade in 2004. And um, this is my timeline. So uh, I was lucky enough to have two children in 2004 and 2007. And um, I really felt that I was able to have a sessional job um, this was within a, acute medicine, which I did for two days a week. And then I did an afternoon um, tuberculosis clinic because TB um, has and always um, and continues to be my sort of main um, area of interest. And I felt that I was able to deliver that, particularly the clinical work and the patient care in a way that worked really well for me so that I was able to provide continuity um, dis despite working very much less than full time. Uh, I felt that I was able to get the balance and my sort of boundaries between home time and, and, and work time well. But also I had lots and lots of opportunities to develop projects, to come up with ideas for um, uh, improving things. I really like working in teams and there were lots and lots of opportunities to do that whilst maintaining my clinical care for patients and looking after my family as well. Um, then the children started school. Um, I got a little bit more time, not a lot more time, but I felt that I was able to become more senior, more experienced, and I became an associate specialist in 2009. And um, by this time, I'd moved purely into respiratory medicine. Uh, and I think one of the defining points for me was that the SAS tutor post, which um, which was developed and I became the SAS tutor for my trust in Bristol 
um, in 2010. And really, that was um, an opportunity to see how different teams work, to get an idea of different people's roles and responsibilities. And uh, I really enjoyed that. I was able to give careers advice. I was able to hear about different people's opportunities, share ideas. And I think my confidence really improved um, from that point on, really, um, such that I was able to take on an um, academy tutor role with Bristol University in 2011. And then um, more recently, I've become an SAS appraiser um, for the trust. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Bristol University undergraduate work. And I think this was probably one of those opportunities to be seized. Um, I was having my appraisal with a consultant colleague and he suggested that this might be something I'd be interested in. I'd not really thought about it before, but it was worked really well with the sessional nature of my job and it allowed me as I was looking to take on more things the time because I think it's time that's often difficult when taking on um, extra roles I felt that being a tutor was something I enjoyed it kept me up to date and I've done similar roles and maybe the same role in different guises since then so when the new university course came out I was able to be involved in some of the curriculum design and delivery I've um, been able to uh, uh, really become very established within the South Bristol Academy so uh, Bristol University has a number of academies within the region students will come out to those academies and I feel that within South Bristol Academy now I've, I've got one of the senior roles and it's really allowed me to um, get a lot of enjoyment and, and job satisfaction. Um, I don't know that I was always proactive or perhaps as proactive as I could have been in asking for advice. And uh, I think as an SAS uh, physician, it is important to ask for the support that you need to develop your roles. So um, developing leadership skills has been um, uh, key, I think. And when I'm thinking about appraisal and being appraised or appraising as an SAS doctor, I think we have to be proactive in making sure that people are getting the support to uh, to you know ascend study leave courses uh, in, in order to sort of reach their their full potential. So um, the undergraduate work has been hugely rewarding. Um, I feel I've learned a lot, and I've also met lots of really interesting people along the way. Um, and I suppose my confidence has grown, and that's allowed me to ask for support a bit more. So if I go back to the, the timeline, the, the, the two things which I think I've really benefited from is that as a result of the SAS Development Fund, I was um, uh, supported to do the Postgraduate Certificate of Medical Education at Bristol University. That was in 2017. So again, able to learn more skills. Um, and then uh, a consultant colleague nominated me for um, fellowship of the Royal College of Physicians and that was so nice to feel um, sort of welcomed into that community and and for those contributions to be to be recognized and it's probably that alongside support from the trust which encouraged me to take on the um, SAS appraiser role and I have to say, I thought that I would be appraising specialty doctors and associate specialists, but I would say it's probably equal amounts of also consultants and locally employed doctors as well. Um, I'm amazed by how much you can learn by being an appraiser. Uh, I do think that it's something that has to be positively encouraged by trusts. And we're and I'm really lucky that, that that's the case. We have five SAS appraisers within our trust and we're, we're actively encouraged and hoping to increase those numbers. And I think that recognition probably um, from individuals when you undertake the, appra the appraisals themselves, but also the trust on that value um, that, that SAS physicians can offer is, has, has been a, a real benefit. 
So I suppose just to sum up, what, what have been the benefits? And I suppose these are the benefits for me, but I hope that some of this will be um, uh, um, would, would, would be benefits for others. I've, I've talked about confidence and I think I really like working in teams and working in those different teams, um, getting tips, ideas uh, from other groups, being able to put people in touch where they may be able to benefit from, from, from other groups has, has been fantastic. And they're the things for me that have resulted in job satisfaction and ultimately in career progression. And um, when I was just putting together these slides, I was thinking, well, is this the career that I had planned? And I'll be honest, it wasn't the career that I had planned, but I have found it really rewarding. And I think maybe I've had some benefits that other um, uh you know, colleagues may not have had. If, if I hadn't become an SAS doctor, I may not have had some of these opportunities. And uh, I, I hope that uh, um, as well as being beneficial for me, being able to give careers advice, um, advice in appraisals, uh, uh, ad advice to, to, to colleagues and, and, and others has, has been has been as helpful um, for, for them as, as it has, has for me. So um, I, I'm probably just going to um, leave it leave it there and thank you very much for um uh listening to 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 this uh this presentation sarah that was brilliant thank you so much and thank you so much for agreeing to to help out with our sas week i absolutely loved looking at your journey and your timeline. And I have said particularly liked the baby graphics. They were excellent. I'm going to have to work out where they come from. Um, but it was so nice to see how actually so many people had supported your journey and that actually clearly your enthusiasm and motivation has really allowed you to make the most of those opportunities. You mentioned in your talk about how positive you felt receiving your fellowship was and I wondered if you could just tell me a bit more about how that came about and what it felt and what it meant to you to be awarded fellowship of the Royal College. Yeah thank you Jamie I mean it, it, it there's something about someone proactively approaching you and saying I'd like to do this which is just the nicest feeling and that's the only sort of Thing I could think to describe it and um, I think it's that the, the, the colleague who nominated me spent so much time preparing that application because I think you know SAS um, becoming uh, uh, fellows was relatively new at the time and the fact that he wanted to make sure that it was as likely to be successful as possible was was really lovely. Um, I think also it did allow me to think actually you know what I have been working quite hard and it's really nice to see that recognised and it was lovely to be able to attend the ceremony and then people say nice things about you and it was yeah it was it was it was really great um, in in that respect but it's actually um, really fueled my sort of wish to sort of share that much more I've been able to nominate colleagues for fellowship myself now and that positivity I think is is really um re really uh one, one of the, the main things I'll take away from that I think and and it was just a really enjoyable day as well yeah something uh, hopefully a really nice memory to look back definitely on. So much of your presentation and hearing you talk then, Sarah, as well, really made me think that actually you are a fantastic role model. And so many of the, the roles that you have, you know, particularly your um, deputy dean role for, for the academy, that must be brilliant. And how fantastic that medical students are seeing someone who's in an associate specialist role, perhaps undertaking a role that even maybe five to ten years ago may not have been opened up to SAS doctors. Is it something that that you talk to them about or do you think they're just incredibly accepting of it and they just sort of see you as 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 part of you know the senior doctor team looking after them? Yeah I think that's interesting and I think that's something that has changed over time because I would say if you'd asked me that question maybe even five years ago, yes I used to spend a lot of time um, 
uh, talking about uh, about um, that role. I do still talk about the SAS role to students because I think they often don't really know what it means, and I think it, it's I think it's helpful to know early on what you know how many different opportunities they are there are and what's right for one person won't be right for another but actually knowing about it is key but I would say that I feel very accepted as an associate specialist in that role now which is is really lovely so I, I wouldn't say that anyone would would question that it's really just um, people being interested and actually it's amazing how many people say oh Sarah could I just get a bit of a careers advice could I just have five minutes just to ask about that and it, it's nice to be able to do that and that's something probably which I'm doing more now than, than, I, than, I, than I would have been 10 years ago. Sarah that's fantastic and we could stay in chat for ages but I'm conscious of time and so just really want to say thank you again because actually what a fantastic and inspirational story i think it was lovely to hear about your appraisal work as well and absolutely fantastic that your organization has got so many people from a diverse range of backgrounds and thank you also for the brilliant work you've been doing in the southwest supporting our sas doctors through the college and shameless plug i know there will be some further events coming up that people should keep their eyes and ears out for but but thank you again sarah so no, thank you and thank you for inviting me. Hi, my name's Dr Helen Bonwick and I'm an Associate Specialist in Palliative Medicine working in the Mersey region. I have a, a split job, so I work three days a week for Marie Curie Hospice Liverpool and two days a week for Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital as the medical lead in Palliative Medicine. I also am a medical examiner for the Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital and have a big educational remit as part of my job role. And we're going to talk about the education part of my role during the next three few slides. So from an SAS point of view, education as, as it is with every healthcare professional is a vital part of our, our role. And I, I would argue that that goes for both undergraduates and postgraduates, and that may be mainly for us in, with regarding the medical team. But actually, in my role in palliative medicine, we do an awful lot of healthcare professional teaching as well. So my 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 remit for education is very very broad, um, and I think that SAS doctors are really well placed to act as educators because we are doctors who are with either trainees or undergraduates a lot of the time and we see what the needs of those undergraduates or postgraduates are and also are often aware of the pitfalls in in what ways education can help develop those people so as a staff grade, when I was appointed, which was quite a reasonable amount of time, probably about 25 years ago, um, part of my remit in my job plan was to carry out undergraduate education for medical students who attended Liverpool University. I had no formal teaching qualifications at that point in time, didn't really, if I'm honest, have any skills that I felt, felt were going to be helpful other than previously having taught people at the bedside as a, a jobbing medical SHO in those times and re medical registrar. So I was lucky to attend a specific teaching course for palliative care physicians and that gave me some really useful tools to sort of take me forward and have not taught ever since then. So as I said before my my education is a, is a significant part of my role. Um, so as soon as I started, I was an appointed and honorary clinical tutor for the University of Liverpool. And also over time, I've also been appointed visiting lecturer for Edge Hill University, where I teach on their non-medical prescribing courses. Um, and recently, I've just been made a clinical sub-dean for palliative medicine within the University of Liverpool. 
and that means coordinating all of the hospice placements that occur within our region of Cheshire and Merseyside. So we have we have seven hospices and our medical students have at least three weeks palliative care experience in a hospice during their fourth year, which is excellent for training from, from a palliative care point of view. So I am, as I say, I'm involved in all sorts of teaching, as I say, to healthcare professionals, other than medical teams at the Heart and Chest Hospital. I'm responsible for educating all members of the team regarding to end of life and palliative care. Um, and I think that we as, as SAS doctors have a responsibility to, to ourselves and our services, but also we have a responsibility to each other to show that certain elements of care and delivery of care, regardless of what they be, are available for us to do. And we are more than able to carry those out, providing we're given the opportunity to gain the knowledge, skills and qualification to do that to the best of our ability. I've been very fortunate. I am quite um, I, I'm quite pushy, so if I think I need skills and education, I'm more than happy to go and try and find that for myself. But also I'm, I'm very keen as a clinical tutor for Health Education England within my area to do that on behalf of other people as well. Um, and I think ultimately what's really important is that educational supervision is part of that process. So within Merseyside and Cheshire, we all of our medical students when they do their palliative care placement, but actually any other placement they're doing clinically have to have an educational supervisor to sign off their portfolio and also to oversee their learning during that placement. And that can be anybody as long as they've had appropriate training. So that can easily be SAS doctors who have said previously are very well placed to carry out that role. I completed my educational supervision course back in 2014 and I educationally supervise any trainees from F1 to ST6s. Uh, currently I have an ST5 trainee, I have an IMT trainee and I have an SAS doctor because in Merseyside and Cheshire we've made the decision within palliative medicine that all SAS doctors should also have an educational supervisor as well as somebody who carries out their appraisal and a line manager. Um, initially as a sort of a, a warning about how you may be put off I was told that associate specialists were not allowed to be educational supervisors because I like to know the answers to why that might not be because I feel I might have that skill set, eventually it became apparent that there was no reason why I couldn't be an educational supervisor as long as I completed the training and was then registered on the GMC database, which which I now am. So I think it, it, it is a salutary point that sometimes you just have to push at the door a little bit to um, ensure that you can go through because the door might be more ajar than you think it is. So I suppose in, in um, sort of summary, in, in the words of the lionesses, if, if you do not see it, you're unlikely to want to be it or think you can be it. So for us as, as SAS doctors, we, we have a, a right to see other people doing the jobs as SAS doctors because we are more than capable. And as I say, we have a responsibility to push some of those ceilings that maybe some people are, are putting in our way, whether that be inadvertent or um, a sort of very clear that we perhaps can't become what we think we can be. Helen, thanks so much. That was absolutely fantastic. And it's really nice to hear about your really varied educational career. I don't know how you managed to fit it all in alongside two, I'm sure, really busy clinical roles as well. I The last slide, I have to say, really resonated with me in terms of not 
being able to be what you can't see. And it's so important that SAS doctors are there and visible for their colleagues. Yeah. I was really interested in particular in, in what you were talking about in terms of educational supervision. And I know that other SAS doctors do sometimes get this response of SAS doctors can't be educational supervisors. Obviously, that isn't the case. But if if we've got individuals who are watching this who would be interested in being educational supervisors, do you have any tips about how they might get involved in that? Um, I suppose initially you it would it's best if you can go through the route of your your line manager, your clinical um stroke medical director um, and also your um, education department within the institution you you work at so um, because palliative care is is quite a small specialty um, our our hospice work is actually quite different but um, for for us I think if you go through those routes though the the people who are responsible for educational supervision within within whichever institution you work in should be able to point you in the direction of courses that will be applicable for you to attend um, and everybody has to attend an appropriate course before they can then be put on the GMC database as a, a formal educational supervisor some people who might not want to be an educational supervisor can just do the clinical supervision element um, and that might be initially what they go for first so that is more the practical part of supervising and any healthcare professional but mainly obviously medical um, staff and and then might want to do that as a phased process so you do that sort of almost cut your teeth on that and then once you've you've you feel that you've got the skills and capabilities of doing that then progress on to the educational supervision process I, I have to say I just did both at the same time because I thought I just needed to do both together um, um, and then once you've you've got the course certainly for us in palliative medicine I think we have the luxury of um, time which I don't think everybody necessarily has in acute specialities we try and this goes for consultants as well as SAS doctors who've become new new educational supervisors we try and mentor the new supervisors so we would get them to observe supervision with a with a trainee or an undergraduate in our case because all of our undergraduates have to be supervised um, formally um, so that they can see that working and then sort of reflect and critique on that process and then what we would do is we would then as a, a more senior educational supervisor be the observer when that new person then starts to act as an educational supervisor so we can do some peer working time peer review but I do appreciate that is, is a big probably a big luxury which other specialties might not have I think it's an ideal as in that's that's the better way for all of us to be but I am aware that we can probably do it but others might not be able to do it I've subsequently actually I've just um, been back and done further studying so I've I've just done a master's module in educational supervision just because I wanted to refresh my skills from 2014 so I, I found that really helpful and that has involved some peer review as part of that process so I've, I've been a long time out and, and as we all know the longer you're doing something the less peer review you have because you're then peer reviewing other people Brilliant. But Thank I, you. I, sorry, sorry, James, I would also say, please don't give up. If you're given an answer of no, you can't be an educational supervisor, then seek us out by the Royal College or you might have Health Education England who you can contact locally. There should be an associate dean within your air, geographical area who should then be able to put, give you pointers within your geographical reason, region to actually sort of bolster up the fact that you can be a supervisor. That's brilliant. And it sort of um, goes back to that brilliant point you made about the door is often more ajar than you think it is. Actually, often yeah. you can find those opportunities. Brilliant that you've just undertaken that master's module. That sounds fascinating. Yeah. I wonder if if I might ask you then for a couple of top tips as a, an experienced educational supervisor, stuff that you found work, has worked really well. Um, I think uh, the, the, the biggest skills are, are listening to whoever you're supervising. So it's very easy to try and give people um, answers because we have more experience. And, and I suppose that goes for everything that we do, doesn't it? We can often see perhaps the way forward for people, um, but 
but actually part of supervision, educational supervision is taking that overview um, with the trainees, the SES doctors, undergraduates, to get them to do the reflection and learning if, if possible. And obviously, if you're asked for advice about how things could be done differently or what suggestions you might have, then step in. Um, in palliative medicine, we, we, we're generally quite good listeners anyway, so it's probably a skill set that we generally have. But we are all, all we are so also um, problem solvers. So we do sometimes quite like to jump in quite quickly because we can see exactly what somebody might need to do to sort the, the issues out. But I think listening is one of them. Um, and also taking you, your time. So interestingly, I'm, I'm just about to do my first educational supervision meeting with my IMT trainee, who's just obviously started last week. So I'm doing that after this. Um, and I think initially you, you don't know, generally don't know each other. So it, it's like any relationship. It's going to work far better if you put some time and effort into to that relationship and every trainee is very different so don't base your current trainees needs and wants on what you might previously ha have seen and, and the other thing is ask for help so if you're not sure about something or you've come across a situation that you really don't know the answer to then you should have be surrounded by colleagues who you can ask those questions of and it isn't you know we are meant to be learning also but we're also modeling learning so actually showing your trainee that you still need to go and ask other people questions and and have those discussions is actually a really fundamental principle that we all do that and we don't expect people to be expert forever and a day because none of us are Great advice, Helen. And please can I just take this opportunity to thank you again for not only helping us with this, but all your fantastic work through the SAS committee and being a brilliant advocate for your region and colleagues. So thank you very much. And You're welcome. Look seeing you soon. Thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak about SAS doctors as policy influencers. Academy's SAS committee's role in making SAS a viable career. I'm Wally Dershid, immediate past RCP SAS lead and immediate past chair of Academy's SAS committee. SAS career generally follows one of the three routes. Majority of SAS stay, develop, and progress in the grade. Some undertake Caesar. Those who aspire to undertake Caesar are around 25%. Those who actually undertake it, around 4%. And those who are successful, 60% of that 4%. And even a lesser return to training. Development, career progression, and recognition within the SAS grade should be the norm rather than an exception. Any viable career needs to have certain components. If we look at the first component, which is autonomy, academy, along with colleges, BMA, Health Education England, and NHS employers have come together to produce SAS Charter in 2014, SAS Doctor Development Guide in 2017, maximizing the potential in 2019, and updating SAS Doctor Development Guide in 2020. These documents look good, read well, and sound well, but SAS lived experiences tell a different story. A city of two tales. And the reason? Only one third of the trusts across the four nations have implemented these. And you may ask yourself, why? Culture. Culture defines careers and changes with action. The change must be both top down and bottom up. We produced SAS Workforce Rhetoric versus Reality in April of 2021, where we called for a culture shift among the profession and employers to better support the SAS workforce. 
we produced sporting appraisal for the SAS workforce in July of 2021. The academy and colleges all agreed that the appraisal and revalidation needs of SAS are similar to that of consultant colleagues, and there must be equity and parity of resources, including SPA time. We noted there was tension between the agency of SAS doctors to develop PDPs and then to carry them out to job planning, where we proposed a set of measures for all stakeholders to make appraisal a sporting and development tool, which is it meant to be. SAS workforce age profile mirrors that of consultant colleagues, but its work mirrors that of much younger doctors in training. BMA's Sporting and Aging Medical Workforce Report of 2019 showed that 25% of SAS are over 55 years old compared to 22% of consultant colleagues. We produced SAS workforce later careers and retirement, where we called for an improved model of working that enables a rewarding career and satisfactory work-life balance for SAS workforce prior to retirement. The second component of a viable career is belonging. We all want to feel a sense of belonging. It's fundamental to the human experience. Our finest achievements are possible when individuals come together to work for a common cause. The GMC survey carried out in 2019 and published in 2020 showed that 70% of SAS felt like valued members of teams, but when it came to decision make, making, only half of them were involved. Good patient care is strongly associated with a motivated and engaged workforce where every individual is empowered to work to their full potential. That was a key message from our engaging and empowering the SAS workforce document. In this document, among other things, we define the role of SAS tutor, SAS advocate, and SAS LNC representative, so they in turn can better support SAS workforce. Our well-being of the SAS workforce paper of November 2020 looked at the causes, the challenges, and proposed a set of measures to improve the well-being of the SAS workforce. The third component of a viable career is autonomous practice or competence. Competence is a great creator of confidence. We endorsed BMS template guidance for autonomous practice in February of 2020. We were involved in certain aspects of creation of specialist grade. The general capabilities framework for the new specialist grade was developed by Task and Finish Group, headed by Kerry McEwen. It had three partners, Academy and Colleges, BME and NHS employers. Professor Goodart, current president of RCP, and I were part of the group. We were very keen that autonomous practice was built into the grade. 1.4 of the framework is a reflection of that. We have called for equity of sport for SAS to develop in extended rules. 
or leadership development for SAS doctors and dentists. Paper recognized SAS as a carrier in its own right. The paper also called that for all leadership opportunities which are available to our consultant colleagues should be available to SAS workforce. 74% of SAS doctors train other doctors and allied health professionals. But less than 5% of us have a formal educational lead role. In our SAS educators paper, we looked at the challenges and proposed solutions to all stakeholders so SAS could be better supported in education and training. Our SAS doctors and dentists and research paper of November 2020 advocated that developing, driving and delivering research was essential for patient care, but also for development, recognition and well-being of SAS workforce. The fourth component of a viable career is development support. All individuals need to be supported to develop so-called deep skills, to have opportunity to hone those skills for their own development and the support of others. Our SAS doctors and Royal Colleges opportunities and support paper showed what was the offer from the Royal Colleges, how it was not consistent and how certain colleges could improve on that offer. Our access to college education e-portfolio for SAS doctors looked at three things. Whether the e-portfolio was available to SAS, what was the ease of accessing it, and how did the ease of access and cost compare to training colleagues? Again, examples of good practice with RCP leading the way, and perhaps room for improvement for certain colleges and faculties. Over strengthening the role of SAS tutor paper, looked at SAS tutor rule across the four nations. How the rule could be supported in terms of challenges which it was facing, so the SAS tutors in turn could better support the professional development of SAS colleagues. SAS carrier journey is self-guided. There are no educational supervisors in early part of the career, and there's hardly any mentorship. That shouldn't be the case. That was a key message from our SAS workforce and mentorship paper. The last component of a viable career is excellence, recognition and reward. Recognition is not a scarce resource. You can't use it up or run out of it. This is what colleges offer. RCP again leading the way and room for improvement for certain colleges. One of the things which we are very proud is we got agreement in principle that all colleges and faculties will recommend appropriate SAS members and fellows for National Honours via Honours Committee. This is something which is also built into RCP SAS strategy. To our delight and surprise, we were the first group to produce a layperson's view on SAS workforce. What's our vision? Our vision is that any specialty doctor should have only two career destinations. Either they become a specialist doctor or they become a consultant via Caesar route. One of the things 
which we have been very keen is to bring all the SAS different strands of work groups together. So Academy's SAS committee, which is composed of SAS leads of all colleges, BMA SAS committee and COPSAS, which are associate deans for all SAS across UK. It is by working together that our voice becomes more powerful and intelligent. And we have started engaging with other stakeholders to make SAS a viable career. If you are interested in finding more about the work of the Academy's SAS committee and the papers which I have alluded to in my presentation. You can do so by following the link on the slide. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present our work. Willie, thank you so much for your fantastic presentation and it's really nice to see you again. I would really like to take this opportunity before I ask you a couple of questions, if I may, just to record my sincere thanks for the brilliant work that you did as the chair of the RCP SAS committee and really making sure that that, that role is valued within the college. But also a big thank you for your work as chair of the AOMRC committee as well. And we're going to be very sorry to see you step aside. And I know you've got two fantastic colleagues picking up the baton, but it has been fantastic. So thank you particularly thinking about the great work that you've been leading both with the college and the AOMRC. I wonder if you had any thoughts for our members and fellows about proactive steps they could take to support particularly the culture in which our um, uh, physician SAS colleagues are working. Uh, thank you very much for the compliments and kind words. In terms of the question, there are different ways whereby RCP members and fellows can support SAS. I think nationally we have led the way by recognizing autonomous practice in our safe medical staffing report, which acts as a template for the specialist grade. We have been very inclusive in allowing SAS to become fellows of the college. We have produced a very ambitious RCP SAS strategy. We are the second college, but our strategy is by far the most ambitious. So nationally, all members and fellows need to continue on supporting, particularly the RCP SAS strategy. In terms of local, where perhaps most of the challenges lie, most of the clinical leads are fellows and members of RCP. And perhaps that's where they need to be more inclusive, ensure that all leadership opportunities as agreed by the RCP and Academy are available to SAS. SAS who join at specialty level are encouraged and supported to become specialists. So there is a career progression. They are supported to have extended roles in leadership, as I have alluded to, in education, research, because RCP is a community, a national community and a community at a local level. And SAS are a part of that and community and it's just sort of supporting them. Fantastic. Thanks, Waleed. And I wonder as my second question, if I might ask in particular, obviously with your AOMRC role, you've been exceptionally well linked into the national picture outside the Royal College and of course looking across Royal Colleges. What do you think the Royal College of Physicians can be doing to support the work of the AOMRC in terms of supporting SAS doctors? I think in terms of RCP, we should be very proud. Academy of SAS committee is a very new committee. It's hardly 
11 years old. Two of the chairs of the committee had been from RCP, which speaks a lot. The first chair of the committee was RCP SAS lead, and then it's me. We set good precedents. One of the rules of SAS committee is to ensure there is consistency across specialties. No SAS is disadvantaged by the specialty which they choose, and we have been leading the way in terms of advocating for autonomous practice, in terms of advocating for SAS role in different spheres of education and training. We are one of the first colleges where SAS are college tutors. So it's continuing our work. And obviously, if we sort of see an example where a college is leading something, we try to sort of follow a type. And I would give you an example. I think if you look at the document, colleges and SAS, the only college which comes closer to RCP is Royal College of Anesthesia. And the reason they have got two SAS council members while we have got one. So a challenge for you, Jamie, how are you going to sort of ensure we end up with two uh, SAS representatives on the council? Thank you. Willie, challenge accepted. I'll see how we get on that. Willie, can I just say an enormous thank you again, not just for your fantastic tenure here and to, with the AIMRC, but also for a brilliant talk. And thank you ever so much for giving up your time today. Thank you very much, Virginia, for all your hard work uh, which you have been doing. And it's been a pleasure being on the talk with you. Thank you. Catherine, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today to have a chat around SAS Week. We're going to have a bit of a conversation, particularly just to share with our members and fellows what we've achieved so far in terms of the SAS strategy and really looking back over what we hope has been a fantastic SAS Week in terms of developing that profile of SAS doctors within college. But clearly the SAS strategy has been, if you like, the jewel in the crown of, of what the college has achieved so far and a great opportunity to really celebrate SAS doctors. I know that you and Waleed, my predecessor, along with Jenny Finn and the rest of the SAS committee, put a huge amount of work into developing that fantastic document. And I wonder if I might start off by asking you, actually, what, what does the SAS strategy mean to you as the, the college registrar? Oh, thanks, Jamie. And it's really great, isn't it, to have been able to be part of such a positive week uh, for college. And it's my second uh, SAS strategy week since becoming registrar, and it's only ever a pleasure. So I think this has been a long journey, hasn't it? If you think back, I don't know whether uh, Waleed remembers the early days when Bod and he were really struggling to raise the profile of the SAS physician community in college. But we've come a long way since then. And I think the articulation of that strategy, getting that to publication, was probably the first milestone for me in really recognising that college was very serious about expanding and consolidating our membership constituency for SAS physicians. So I think the first highlights, the first goal has been achieved. It's that very visible document which sets out against the wider college strategy, the vision for SAS physicians within our professional community of practice. And I think if I were to pick highlights from that particular document, for me, it's going to have to be, as we've heard today, around the education and professional support of SAS physicians, because this is about lifelong education and learning it's not about a, a single point in time uh, educational opportunity. And I, I, and I guess I would say that about college in general. Uh, I've just done a, a little video for the fellowship more widely, and I, it started by saying this is not about four letters uh, after your name. 
This is about being part of that community of practice and benefiting from the huge knowledge and experience you can get from colleagues just working at a regional and national level. So for no other reason uh, that this strategy has been important, what it's doing, I think, is opening the opportunity for SAS physicians to work beyond their local trust with a community of practice. So that education, so, uh, education practice and professional support, I think for me, has got to be the driver and the way in which we now embed and implement the strategy for college. I don't know what you think. I mean, you're the new lead. How does it feel <laughs> for you? Uh, I should be asking you this question. You should. Um, I, it has been wonderfully welcoming. And I have to be honest that my involvement with college before I took on the SAS lead role had very much been initially as a as then core medical trainee and undertaking my membership exams. And then I'd, I'd sort of paid my fee and been aware of things like information coming through, but I suppose I hadn't been particularly proactive in the way that I'd engaged. And then I did my PhD and stepped into a, uh, an associate specialist role. And actually one of the great things that I found, particularly through the SAS strategy, was a real awareness of how proactive the college is being in supporting SAS colleagues. And I think you're absolutely right around that community of practice, because being a physician at the moment anywhere in the world is pretty challenging. Yeah. But I think being an SAS physician in the UK has perhaps historically been seen as a bit of a role that people fall into rather than a role that they proactively seek out. And I really think that's changed. I think people for example, with my background, who decided actually I can see real positives in, in going into this role and now being really, really well supported by college in the fact that actually parity of esteem in terms of, for example, I know one of the things we were going to chat about was about being able to be a PACES examiner. Actually, that's a really wonderfully prestigious thing to do fantastically focused on education, but also a great recognition of the skills uh, and expertise that SAS doctors have. So um, I think it's really exciting to see it written down on paper. I think it's also really challenging because it gives me a very clear roadmap. And whilst we've had some really early wins, like increasing our fellowship numbers, ensuring that individuals are able to access um, you know, the ability to train as PACES examiners, there is a lot more work to do. And I think that is going to be the big challenge. Yeah, I was I was very uh, pleased to understand from our then chief examiner when I chased this down last year that uh, SAS doctors are able to examine for MRCP uh, because I do think it's that but the bi-directional learning you get from being both a teacher and having been examined yourself in one capacity or another, that's so important. So, um, that the challenge, of course, as you know, will be getting people to come forward for that role and to get them trained in a timely manner. So I'm hoping that people listening to this who are inspired by that opportunity will, if they're not already members of college, uh, get themselves uh, put, put themselves forward for membership or fellowship even, because maybe that's that's the next big win, isn't it? I think potentially uh, for college this year in reforming its fellowship process, uh, we are quite clear that there is equity and parity for SAS doctors who with the appropriate uh, skill set will be uh, eligible for fellowship. And I, I know we were going to sort of perhaps, you know, sort of make that point uh, on several uh, parts of this conversation, but I, th I think it's worth just mentioning now that this is easy to do at the press of a button from, from, the, from the website. Uh, and that people shouldn't be worried about putting themselves forward. Uh, we would really welcome their knowledge and expertise and, and to expand, because I think there's something about critical mass too in an organisation that we haven't really alluded to, but is very real in terms of uh, getting the uh, your, your voice heard. I think you're other, right. Yeah. And the only other thing I would say, of course, is that the one thing that Walid and Bod did achieve for the SAS physicians was that position on council, which is the democratic governing body of, of the college. Uh, and the SAS lead has a voting, voting place on that council, which, again, incredibly important, not just attending uh, council, but actually a voting member. 
So a uh, lots to look forward to. But I, I, I might just challenge you a little bit and ask you, given that we've got this articulation, I've picked out these, you know, so my sort of top area where I think it where we're we're going to focus on. I want to just explore with you a little bit about uh, implementation. It's always the harder part, isn't it? It's quite it's one thing to articulate the strategy, but what does that actually mean on the ground? I, we were challenged at the AOR MOC day, you know, by some of your staff's colleagues who had seen the strategy to say, well, it's all very good to talk the talk, but how are you going to walk the walk? And so uh, maybe that's a question I can ask you in your your next year as SAS lead as you uh, as you're orchestrating this offering. What are the what are the early wins? Uh, and what are going to be the challenges of implementation? A really good question. It feels like being interviewed all over again. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I think, I think the the initial foundation work has really been done, and I think what is so pleasing is how welcoming the college is, but also how welcoming council is. And obviously, at the last council meeting, I gave an update on what we were doing, and it was just lovely to see lots of nodding and smiling faces, people engaged interested and the number of people who came up to me afterwards and emailed me to say what can I do to help and that's really really nice and and I suppose my role is to capitalize on that because actually as a membership organization but as a, a diverse organization it is about making sure that we are making the most of those links but I think actually the SAS group in particular is, is a wonderfully diverse group of doctors and one of the big challenges for me is making sure that we really represent that very diverse group of individuals and diverse in in every sense, not just character uh, protected characteristics, but in terms of roles and ambitions and where people want to end up. And that's both exciting, but also extremely challenging because making sure that all of those people have a voice and that really importantly that that voice is heard is really key. And I think that's where the SAS committee really comes in, because we do have a great structure of regional representatives from across all parts of the UK and indeed through the specialist societies who work with the college. And that really means that we can capture a diverse group of individuals. But that committee is only as strong as the individuals who are part of it. And we have a number of individuals who've been doing brilliant work for a very long time who are coming to the end of their tenure and so will demit soon. And we actually have some vacant posts, I'm sure, because everyone is busy around COVID. But actually, that's a great opportunity for people to get involved. It's not onerous. It's not a huge task. It is a great way to make sure that voices are being heard and that we're really thinking about where we where we direct our endeavours. And it's a brilliant way to be introduced to college and that community of practice. And I think things, you know, concrete things I want to deliver on, particularly in the next year or so, is a big increase in the number of fellows so that we have an even greater voice within college and that community of practice. Greater work looking at things like the CESAR process and working proactively with the GMC to make sure that that remains up to date and, and very much fit for purpose but also really asking some difficult questions about how we support colleagues to get involved, not just in education, but also in research and what can the college do around that? And, and that is a big topic, but actually it needs serious thought. And, and that isn't my area of expertise, but I kind of see my ways of bringing people together. It's about bringing that committee together and, and sharing those thoughts. So I'm interested that you've really picked up on, on the, on the sort of regionality. Uh, of the work of the college, because sometimes it can feel quite remote and national and London centric, or it's, I, I actually don't think that's true, but I think there has been a perception. And I think one of the ways in which it becomes less of that is for people to understand that it is driven by that regional agenda and that the regional SAS representative has a major role in influencing uh, the policy and strategy for college. And, and along those lines, of course, you have uh, advocated for uh, the creation of a SAS co college tutor role, which would tie in that educational piece that we were talking about, lifelong learning. Do you want to say a little bit about, about that role? Because I think that, that sounds to me to be a very exciting way of blending even further the constituency, membership constituencies of the college with the community on the ground. 
Yeah, of course. And thank you. Um, that was a, a nice reminder of something that we're really promoting and, and really keen on developing. And the College Tutor Network has been something that has been extremely helpful in terms of supporting our internal medicine trainees. And indeed, when I was there, a core medical trainee, you know, someone within every organisation who is there to really, really promote the education and development of individuals within organisations. And actually, it's worked so well under the brilliant leadership of particularly recently Joe Schramm, our Lineker Fellow, that it seems like a great opportunity to model something similar around SAS doctors because the needs of SAS doctors are going to be different, but having an individual within an organisation who can support that education and development is going to be so key. And particularly referring back to that diversity before, of course, we know from the statistics that it's much more likely that an SAS doctor will be from an international medical graduate background. And of course, supporting individuals who are IMGs into roles within the NHS and indeed any healthcare provider in the UK, of course, requires bespoke and different levels of support. And that's something that I think someone on the ground can really do. But again, it's also about parity of esteem. It's about saying, look, we really value this role. It is about lifelong learning. And I think there would be a huge value in, you know, I can well imagine having a, a college tutor and someone who's supporting SAS doctors and really them working very closely together because I think that strength in numbers is so important. And I think there are examples around the country where people are already doing this. So this is, you know, not not wishing to reinvent the wheel what we want to do is capitalize on those models that are already delivering realistic professional support and educational supervision and development for people on the ground so this is all about for me making colin college really relevant and relatable uh, and for people to visibly see within college that it's people like them that are part of that that community of practice. So it, I, I think that's particularly exciting, that development. I'm going to watch that space with, with, with interest. <laughs> I'm very, uh, it, I'm glad you picked up on the uh, our IMG uh, colleagues, because I, I do think there's something about having something that is bespoke for people's needs. Uh, and it may be very subtly different, the offer, but we need to know what what those what that offer needs to look like so again some focus groups some some listening about where the gaps are would really help college and if, if and if colleagues are able to help us shape that agenda then i think you know for me as registrar that's you know my 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 title is is apparently i'm responsible for clinical and professional affairs well you know i need to know that that, that that's a holistic uh, and meaningful title uh, not just something that people write down occasionally when I get wheeled out for conversations like this. It's um, <laughs> It sounds like one of those brilliant things that is, is wonderfully broad and on the plus side means that I imagine as registrar it gives you carte blanche to basically uh, get involved in whichever areas you like in college. <laughs> I think I'm naturally curious so it does <laughs> it does satisfy my natural curiosity. Yeah. Absolutely and I think yeah, Curiosity is perhaps something quite nice to, for us to sort of wrap up our conversation on, because I think what I really want to emphasise to those listening who may already be members, might be fellows or may not be members or fellows at all, is that the college has made a huge, huge commitment to supporting SAS doctors. But to do that, we need to make sure that the voice within college is, is really loud. And to, the best way of doing that is by being part of a membership organisation. It is only as strong as those people who subscribe to it. And actually, the most powerful position you can be in in terms of that membership site is being a fellow of the college. And as you alluded to earlier, the fellowship process is now really very straightforward. You can self propose, which is fantastic. I know from having been through fellowship myself recently that actually it is completely painless. It is really, really straightforward. And actually what's lovely in my role is also knowing what goes on behind the scenes, that actually there is a very fair, very equitable and very robust, but not in a scary way, process of making sure that people are really very, very fairly treated. And so I suppose my kind of rallying cry as we get towards the end of end of our chat is 
please if you're if you're watching if you're not a fellow but you've been thinking about it please take that leap we would absolutely love you to have be part of college i'm sure you're watching this because you're passionate about improving the life for yourself and for your colleagues and actually becoming a fellow is a, is a great way to do that and again i know catherine and al gilmore your deputy work very hard around the process which is i have to say magnificently streamlined well it's the uh... No process is perfect, but it's definitely made life, I think, so much easier for all of us. And uh, so I would, uh, after watching us tonight, maybe we've got a few people out there who will go off to the website and click on that button and just start your proposal because it's really easy to do. So we'll end on that, shall we, Jamie? It's been, yeah, thank you. It's been a great week. Thanks. For, thanks for all you're doing as, as SAS lead to help promote SAS, the SAS community in college. It's really great to work with you again fantastic and to you Catherine <laughs> thank you very much right, take care bye. everyone bye bye bye